Good afternoon. My name is Russ Riley, and I am a compliance officer with FDA's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations. The majority of what we do involves drug manufacturing inspections, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So to start with, uh, I want to talk about the reasons why we do inspections, uh, as well as how we do inspections and what you can expect if you're on the receiving end of one of these um, throughout its whole life cycle. So uh, before the inspection, during it, afterwards, as well as what are the potential outcomes for such inspections. So to begin with, uh, let's make sure we're all on the same level as far as what, what I mean when I say manufacturing. So to begin with, that manufacturing includes the obvious stuff. So uh, producing the product, putting it into packaging, applying labels, storing, shipping, that kind of thing, the obvious stuff. Uh, but it also includes support activities, so testing the product. Uh, material handling, um, so controls as far as ingredients or in process steps. Uh, and also things like quality oversight. So what are the controls that a company has in place to make sure that the product they're making is of sufficient quality? Uh, and uh, safety and effectiveness. And as far as the types of inspections we do, or the types of drugs we inspect, so there's the obvious commercial distribution, drugs going to patients and consumers, but there's also uh, drugs being produced for clinical trial use. So these are not commercial drugs, but they are still going in people, uh, but also batches that are produced in preparation for such things. So. Uh, things like pilot batches and um, exhibit batches and all of the R&D work that goes into producing uh, these products. And then the majority of the inspections that we do cover either finished drug products or the active ingredients, but uh, it is worth knowing that we do have the authority to cover other things like the inactive ingredients, container closures, it's not common that we do, but it, it has been done. And, and we, like I said, we do have that authority. And then as far as the reasons why we do these inspections. So in general, it's about uh, looking at a drug manufacturer's controls, uh, the controls they put in place to make sure that the drugs that they send to patients and consumers are safe and effective and of sufficient quality. There are uh, regulations that they need to follow uh, called CGMPs, stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices, as well as uh, specific commitments that, um, that companies make in their uh, applications, NDAs, ANDAs, BLAs, that kind of thing. Um, but again, the general purpose for these are, they're meant to be proactive in nature. So these are proactive controls on the parts of uh, drug manufacturers and proactive inspections on our part. And most people, when they think of an inspection like this, they're thinking of what we call surveillance inspections. So as far as we know, everything is fine at a given manufacturer, but we periodically check up on them to make sure. There's also approval related, so pre and post approval. So a pre approval inspection is when an application looks pretty much ready to, for approval, or at least it's getting close to it. And uh, we send someone out to make sure that everything the company has submitted is in fact accurate and the company's ready to produce. Uh, Post-approval has to do with evaluating commitments made in the application. But we also do things called compliance follow-ups, which are after we've taken some action against a company, maybe submitted, uh, sent them a warning letter or had a, held a regulatory meeting or something like that. But there are also a lot of other inspections we do. So in response to certain things that are um, external to the company. So they conducted a recall, if FDA receives a consumer complaint, uh, if there's particularly worrisome or unusual adverse events, that kind of thing. And as far as what inspections um, encompass, you know, I frequently get asked by people who, you know, I'm, I first met and they find out what I do, how long does an inspection take? And I always kind of laugh because it, I mean, I've had inspections take less than a day and I've had them take over a month. It, it just depends on how complex what the company does is and how many different products and how risky the products are, low, or low versus high risk. And also some inspections are comprehensive in nature where we're really trying to cover all or at least almost all of what they do. And some are very limited, you know, just following up on a single complaint, for example, 
So there's there's a great variety in these inspections. So there can be. So what happens on an inspection? Well, so first off is the obvious thing, right? We watch operations. If a company, uh, if a facility is producing product, we should be watching that. If they're packaging it, if they're testing it, um, all things that, that we should be watching. Uh, the extent to which we watch them can depend on things like how automated they are versus how manual they are, um, how complicated they are. Uh, sometimes we're observing to see if we can find problems. Other times it's a matter of learning the process. Uh, but a significant part of our inspections also have to do with records. So uh, it's not it's not just enough to watch the company make it, but you know there should always be records for each time they make it and records for how to make it, things like procedures and batch records and various studies and all of which fall under the types of records that we review. And again, that these tend to be the majority of a lot of our inspections. We also do a lot of talking to people and not just managers or quality people too. I mean, from top to bottom, left to right, I'll talk to an analyst in the lab or operator on the line to vice president in charge of the quality or, or packaging, for example. So depending on what it is that I'm trying to find out, uh, I usually try to talk to as many employees as I can, as I can to find out what's actually happening at a company. Uh, also, we sometimes might do field exams, which basically means just examining products. So a good example of this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sterile injectable drugs need to be free of particulates. So I may pick up some vials of drug and look at them very closely. Do I see particulate? Um, I certainly shouldn't, and odds are very good I won't. But if I do, that tips me off that there's something really bad going on right here. Um, also, we sometimes collect samples. Uh, it could be finished product samples or ingredients, or it could include things like environmental swabbing if we think that there's a, a contamination coming from a dirty environment, for example. And finally, uh, it's quite common for us to take photos and video. Uh, there are companies out there that seem to think that that is not under our authority, but it definitely is. Um, Okay, so further into what goes into an inspection like this. So when we discuss scope, um, the simple way to say it is it's all within scope. So anything having to do with the manufacturing uh, in all of the meetings that I, I said a couple uh, slides ago, uh, those all fall in, all operations, all records, all employees. Uh, and that's not just the regulations, the, the current good manufacturing practices, but applications as well. And another thing to know is the inspection is driven by the FDA employee who's there. Um, most companies I go, I've gone to know that. Occasionally I'll have companies try to try to run the thing and tell me what I'm doing tomorrow and the next day. And I have to politely step in and say, you know, I'm sorry, this is my inspection. I'm the one, I'm the one running where this goes. Um, just kind of standard housekeeping stuff. Any domestic inspection should start with issuing an FDA form 42, just a record of, uh, who I am and what I'm there for, that kind of thing. Uh, and showing federal credentials, so proof that I actually am from the FDA. And then some inspections will end with what's called an FDA Form 483, which is essentially a list of violations or potential violations that I found during the inspection. And in terms of what we'll look at, so again, we'll look at what records of what has been done, so batch records, testing records, uh, and also how they're done, things like um, procedures and work instructions and policy documents, that kind of thing. You know, but a good chunk of what we look at has to do with the company's evidence that uh, what they do is effective to achieve their stated goal. So a good example is cleaning. If you look at the regulations of the current good manufacturing practices, they don't say how how to clean equipment or what constitutes clean equipment. They simply say that equipment has to be cleaned according to cleaning procedures and they have to be cleaned sufficiently enough for their intended use. So that means that the onus for proving that the cleaning operation is sufficient falls on the company, which ends up mean, meaning that you do things like cleaning studies and um, essentially challenging your cleaning operation. And that's the kind of thing I'll review. 
but it's really meant to be a freeing thing because depending on the nature of the product that's being made, the nature of the equipment, even the nature of the people working for the company, there can be such a wide variety of what it can, what is, what constitutes effective cleaning. And uh, it's, it's better to let companies find that out for each individual circumstance than for us to simply try to take a top-down approach. So, and that's not just cleaning, that's, you know, proving that test methods are, um, are accurate and effective. Um, computer systems that are being used for critical functions will operate as intended. So, uh, and other examples like that. Uh, it is worth knowing that uh, if you've never gone through one of these inspections, they are usually unannounced. So if someone shows up with credentials, of course, saying they're from the FDA, they're here to inspect, that uh, is legitimate. Um, we don't always call ahead of time. Uh, in fact, we usually don't. And like I said, the length of an inspection and what it is we're focusing on can vary quite a bit. Uh, one thing I will say is the two things that can definitely lengthen inspections is either finding significant violations, because of course then we need to take time to collect the evidence and investigate how widespread and how deep those problems are, and also ev evasiveness on the part of the firm. I mean, the more cooperative a company is during an inspection, the faster that inspection is going to go, which is to everyone's benefit. And finally, uh, now that I've mentioned evasiveness, this is the part where I should say that false statements to uh, FDA employees and falsified records uh, can be federal crimes. And just to be clear, crimes can be committed by companies, but they can also be committed by individuals. So if there's ever a time where an employee of a company is uh, asked or instructed to uh, to falsify a record or to lie uh, to an FDA employee, it's worth keeping in mind that the price might be paid by the individual and not the company. So I want to talk a little bit about expectations, both on the part of FDA and on the part of the company. So I'll start with expectations on the part of the FDA. Uh, and recurring theme so far, uh, open access to all operations, records, and employees within scope. So um, allowing us to do our job, essentially. And that first word, timely, is important as well. Um, the longer it takes to uh, get access to, uh, to a certain employee or to certain records, not only is that going to prolong the inspection, again, which no one wants, but also that's just going to make us all the more suspicious. If, if everything is fine with this record, why is it taking so long, right? And when I, uh, I put in their definition of operations. So what I mean by that is operations don't just include physical things like widgets coming out of a machine or labels being applied to uh, pill bottles or that kind of thing, right? Operations include things like complaint handling and uh, the database um, for storing uh, laboratory data, for example. So those are all, you know, even though they're not physical operations, those are operations that are within the scope of an inspection like this. And I also want to point out that when I say records, uh, I think most people, when they hear record, they think of a document like a, a piece of paper, right? And that obviously is one example of a record, but um, ever more now than uh, increasingly uh, every year, more and more records are digital in nature. So uh, that could be something as simple as, you know, the equivalent of a paper record, right? A PDF or a Word document, for example. But it can also mean things like databases. I mean, if a company's complaint operation, right? A great example, like very critical, uh, receiving and handling and investigating complaints. If all of that is handled via a database, um, then FDA has access to that database. Uh, whether that means um, uh, collecting a spreadsheet version of that or simply looking over someone's shoulder while they go through the database and saying, what does that mean? What does that mean? Click here, click there. So again, all within our authority. Another expectation that FDA has during an inspection is that questions be answered truthfully. Uh, you know, again, I, I can't stress this enough. So much of the way this works depends on companies being truthful and uh, answering our questions during inspection are is an, ex an essential example of that. And finally, the safety of the investigator. Um, there can be hazard hazardous operations at some of these uh, facilities and the people at the facility know what's hazardous and what isn't much better than we do. So uh, 
uh, that is definitely an expectation on our part. Please make sure that we stay safe. If we can't enter a room without putting on PPE, please let us know if uh, either provide PPE or if need be, we can get our own. Most companies will provide it. It's just faster that way. And I also want to talk about expectations on the part of the firm. So the company that's being inspected does have some expectations of FDA. One of them is um, that inspections occur at reasonable times and in a reasonable manner. And those are actually words uh, directly from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And what that really means is that inspections can occur when a company is in operation. So if, for example, um, a manufacturing plant only operates eight to five Monday through Friday and no one's there the rest of the time, I can't expect an inspection to happen on a Saturday or on a Tuesday night, right? I can't make you open up just so I can inspect you. Now, having said that, sometimes companies have operations that they don't exactly understand fall into this category. And a good example of that is cleaning. So it's not unusual for cleaning crews to come in overnight. And if they're cleaning in areas where operations occur, so uh, production, packaging, labeling, that kind of thing, then that those do fall under the CGMPs. And that would be, you know, if that happens at midnight, then that is a reasonable time to inspect. That's not incredibly common, but it definitely happens. I, I've done it before. And as far as a reasonable manner, um, what that really gets at is a company cannot be compelled to conduct operations. So if I go to inspect a plant that makes tablets and, and capsules, and at the beginning I say, hey, let me see uh, what you have planned for the week, what your production schedule is, and you're making capsules all week and not making tablets, I can't say, I'm here to look at tablets, so you better make them. It doesn't work like that. Uh, another expectation on the part of the firm is that investigators should say why they're doing the inspection, right? Is it general? Is it focused on a certain application, follow up to a complaint, et cetera? Um, and investigators should be discussing their findings, at least on a, on a daily basis. Uh, depending on the nature of an inspection, sometimes you don't speak up right at the moment you observe something, but daily basis is, is definitely uh, the most common frequency to do that. And if an investigator doesn't, doesn't offer it up, you can ask. Say, hey, at the end of each day, beginning of each day, can we talk about uh, what the findings are? And that's a great opportunity for firms to clarify misunderstandings on the part of the FDA employee as well and ask questions and, and that kind of thing. And finally, it's worth knowing things like uh, financial data, um, private personnel data is off limits, right? There's knowing where an employee lives or how much an employee makes has no bearing on, on their uh, ability to produce drugs. So. Uh, there's no reason that should be for. Okay, so how to prepare for an inspection like this? Um, so I would say if you work for a drug manufacturer and you want to be prepared when we walk through the door, unannounced most likely, um, for one, knowing who handles each part of the operation. Uh, so during an inspection, if I'm the one there and I say, uh, hey, I'd like to talk to the person I'd like to talk to somebody about um, the test method for product ABC. Uh, knowing quickly either who that is or at least who to ask for the best person is the best way to go, simply because the sooner the FDA investigator gets the right information, the sooner that they can decide whether things are, are compliant or uh, whether there's a problem and then investigate from there. Uh, not knowing who to turn to can, can definitely slow things down. Another thing is making sure all employees understand that when FDA employees talk to them, they have to answer questions truthfully. Don't don't give the answer you think they want to hear, or you they you know they think their managers want them to say, but tell them that, you know tell the truth. Uh, again, in, in, impress upon them the um, the potential consequences of lying to to FDA employees, and also make clear to them if they don't understand what's being asked of them, they can ask for clarification. Uh, that's uh, uh, definitely understandable. I'd much rather somebody ask me for clarification than, you know, there's a miscommunication, I get an answer to something I didn't ask, suddenly I have violations in mind that are inaccurate that no one wants that, right? And the other thing is, if an employee doesn't know the answer to a question, they should feel free to say so. Look, I'm sorry, sir, that's not something I'm, it's not part of my responsibilities, maybe my boss knows or something like that. 
And finally, uh, the, just being prepared to obtain whatever records I miss or make copies, you know, again, go to uh, know where they are in the files or who the file codes are, what uh, IT system hosts those records, for example. Okay, so as far as hosting an inspection, the typical approach I see is that there will be a primary point of contact um, or host, what I often hear. And that's just a person who um, the investigator kind of mainly interacts with, right? I mean, even if it's not, that person doesn't have all the answers, usually they don't, they're able to find the right people who do, um, find the records that are asked for, also coordinate things like walkthroughs, right? I mean, if I'm if I ask to walk through the, the laboratory, um, I'm probably gonna be asking questions about the laboratory. So having the right people to answer those questions um, is generally a good idea. Making sure I'm gowned correctly, you know, I, depending on if it's a micro lab, that's a pretty good uh, that we're gonna be um, having to put on things like booties and, and gowns and that kind of thing. So again, someone who knows those things and, and can help make sure that the, the inspection moves as smoothly as possible. And quite often they'll take notes as well. It's always good to take notes. Um, if ever there's a need to, there's a misunderstanding, there's a need to compare um, that person's notes to the FDA investigator's notes, uh, may figure out the nature of a miscommunication, for example. So uh, not to mention higher ups tend to take interest in how things are going. So notes are always good. Uh, like I said, daily summary at the end or beginning of each day. Um, and you know, oftentimes investigators will discuss plans, right? So, I mean, sometimes they may decide that showing up and surprising them is the best option, but you know, quite often it, it does make things move, move more move more smoothly. If you say where you're gonna be the next day, right? So, you know, maybe get some PPE ready for me to walk through the, um, uh, the hazardous uh, part of production, for example. Uh, it's also a good opportunity to ask questions, um, it's actually a very good opportunity to have senior management show up as well. Uh, we're always interested in having uh, upper level managers know how an inspection is progressing. And if we're having trouble obtaining what we need, talking to the people we need, or if everything's going great, um, you know, we're happy to share that too, of course. Okay, so after an inspection is done, uh, if an inspection ends with the issuance of a 483, uh, so a list of uh, violations or potential violations that are found, um, or sometimes when it doesn't, uh, there are certain types of violations that we actually do, are not supposed to put on 483s. So for example, um, if we suspect a drug is being illegally marketed because it doesn't have an approved application or uh, something about the content of the labeling, those are two examples of things that in general we don't put on 483s in most circumstances. So but we would still discuss it. So um, that would still be something that at the end of the inspection we would discuss. And there's no requirement for a company to submit a response to the FDA, but it's always in their best interest to do so because if FDA doesn't get a response, we think you either don't care or don't understand why something is a problem. Whereas if a company sends a response in writing and says, look, you know, we, um, we understand what you found, uh, here's what we're going to do in the future to keep this from happening again. Any impact on product already in the market, we are investigating and we will let you know. Um, the, it, it's always in your best interest to send information like that. And, and if you're ever not sure where to send it, the investigator can definitely tell you. Uh, another good thing about responses is, uh, another recommended recommendation is submitting evidence for any actions that you take. So if, for example, you correct a problem by revising an SOP, don't just say you revised it, but submit the revised version, right? Uh, or if a correction is uh, buying a new piece of equipment, let's say an improved uh, piece of equipment. Uh, same thing, don't just say you did it, but you know maybe send in invoices or documentation for how to use the piece of equipment or a photo of it in your facility or something like that. Um, and then you know as far as the uh, the last uh, dash there, giving a timeline for future updates. So. Um, some corrections take longer than others, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, no one expects a new major piece of equipment to be in place and in use in a couple of weeks. So if something's gonna take a while, just let us know and give us some idea of you know when you expect that, right? A month, three months, six months, what have you. And then uh, once you 
once you cross that bridge a few months down the line, you can always submit an updated response. In fact, that's a pretty common thing is to get not just one response, but two, three, or four as the longer term corrections um, uh, that take place in our anatomy. And actually, the, uh, our policy is to, um, uh, is to only consider responses that are received within 15 business days of the close of the inspection. So before we had this policy, sometimes there would be examples of companies taking quite a long time, a month, two months, three months, and FDA would wait to get the response. And when we would get it, it wouldn't be good enough. And when we tried to head forth with uh, some kind of action, um, the question started to be raised, well, if, it, if this is so bad, why did you wait so long? So we instituted this policy to essentially say, you know, even if a correction is in the future, let us know within 15 business days for us to take it into account in terms of our decision on the case. So every inspection gets classified and usually it's one of three classifications. So the top one, if we don't find anything significant, any significant violations, then it's, we call it no action indicated or NAI. Uh, or if we find violations or potential violations and they, uh, they're not significant enough for us to take an action, then we call that VAI or voluntary action indicated. And most inspections fall into one of these two categories. But when an inspection is, uh, if the, when the findings are egregious enough, then we'll call it OAI, which stands for official, official action indicated. And like I said, most inspections are NAI or VAI. OAI is the minority. Um, and to be clear, when an inspection is OAI and there's an action taken, there's a number of things that go into that, into that. So the most obvious, of course, is the significance of what we found. Um, but also there's what kind of a threat that the findings pose to public health um, based on the, the nature of the product, the risk of the product, uh, that kind of thing. Also the nature of the operation. Another thing we take into account is the firm response. So if there's no response or an in, in, inadequate response, then that makes it more likely that we're going to take an action because we don't think that the company can be relied upon to come into compliance themselves. Uh, and by contrast, uh, similar company, simple, similar findings uh, with an adequate response can go a long way toward satisfying us that you should be given the, the company should be given the chance to fix their own their own problems. And also a history of non-compliance. So, you know, if there's a facility or a company that Time after time that we go, we keep finding significant problems. Each time it gets harder and harder to think that we can trust them to fix their own problems. And it gets more and more likely that we're gonna take action to make sure that they come into compliance. Now, the majority of regulatory actions uh, that we do take are, are not judicial in nature. So they do not involve going to a judge or to court um, so examples of that are regulatory meetings where we invite senior officials in from a company to sit down, discuss the problems and give them an opportunity to, you know, present their, their fixes, their, their proposed corrective and preventive actions, ask questions of us. Maybe there's something fundamental that they're not quite understanding. And it, it also gives FDA an opportunity to impress upon the company uh, how important coming into compliance is both for the public health and for them. There are also warning letters. So most people have heard of FDA warning letters um, and it's just that it's FDA's official warning uh, that a company is significantly out of compliance with specific examples of how that's the case. There are also untitled letters, which are a little bit softer in language, but it's a, a kind of a similar idea. One of the big differences there that's worth knowing is the warning letter is actually posted online. So it's not just announced to the company, uh, it's letting the whole world know that that a specific company has been warned due to non-compliance. Another example of a non-judicial action that we'll take is, so for example, for a pre-approval inspection, we can withhold approval. So if an application is approvable by any other standard, but the inspection turns out, um, if an inspection finds significant violations and uh, we don't have confidence that we can rely on a company to effectively produce drugs of sufficient quality, 
then we can withhold approval until they fix their problems. Uh, another type of, uh, of agency action that applies to foreign facilities is an import alert, which is what it sounds like. It's basically um, cutting off a foreign facility from uh, the domestic market, from the U.S. market. So that is the type of action that does not to go does not need to go through the courts. Now, again, most inspections do not end up uh, in OAI status with FDA taking action. And most of the time we do take action that does not involve a judge. But sometimes we do have to go to that stage, take a company to court or take product to court. So an example of that is seizure, which is where we present evidence to a judge that a product is, um, so, is so egregiously in violation of the law that it needs to be taken by federal marshals. And if a judge agrees, he will order the marshals to do so. Another example, and this is probably one of the more common judicial actions that we do, is uh, called an injunction. If you've ever heard of a consent decree, that is essentially an injunction that a company has agreed to. Same basic idea. And it's where a judge orders a firm to take action or more often to cease certain activities until specified requirements are met. So usually that takes the form of, if it's based on uh, poor manufacturing controls, for example, then it takes the form of a judge saying, uh, until, you, until you fix your manufacturing control problems sufficiently to satisfy the FDA, then you will not be allowed to produce product or distribute it to the market. And then there will be a back and forth between FDA and the company. And once they're finally in compliance, then FDA can allow them to reach the market again. Uh, it's one example. There are other versions of that. The, the last one there, prosecution, is quite unusual for non-criminal offenses. Um, so uh, prosecution for violating uh, CGMPs, for example, uh, the preventive controls we've been discussing um, are definitely unusual, but they do happen. They have happened in the past, uh, including things like fines and jail time. So in the most egregious of cases, prosecution is definitely can definitely be on the table. And that's something worth knowing uh, on manufacturer's part. So other outcomes from inspections of drug manufacturing. Uh, it is worth knowing that once a firm is classified as OAI, um, that or the most recent inspection of a firm is classified OAI, then they will likely not get new applications approved. So new NDAs, ANDAs, BLAs, for example. Um, that is uh, one of the common outcomes of that. Also, uh, the inability to obtain government contracts. So that is, um, you know, these are uh, potential financial hits that companies can take as a result of uh, significant non-compliance. Also, things like recalls. I mean, if we sometimes if a company is bad enough and we have specific product that we found uh, significant violations, we will try to convince the company um, to recall the product to remove the threat to public health. And sometimes companies don't agree to recall, at which point we will uh, on occasion issue FDA press releases where we'll say, we found significant problems with company X. We asked company X to recall the product and they refused to. So we're letting everyone know that we recommend you don't use their product. Another common outcome is uh, a company voluntarily ceasing production and or distribution until significant violations have been have been corrected. Uh, again, this is not an FDA action per se, uh, but it it's a voluntary action that companies can take, and it, it does go away toward uh, a company's ability to prove to FDA that they understand the significance of our findings and of being in violation of the law. Okay, so I just covered a lot. Uh, I have a couple challenge questions for you. So first off, uh, question one, drug manufacturing inspections do not typically cover A, production, B, testing, C, adverse event procedures, or D, quality controls. Give you a little time to, uh, to come up with an answer. Okay, 
Five more seconds. All right, the correct answer is C, adverse events, event procedures. So adverse event procedures means the, um, uh, the procedures and databases uh, involving receiving and investigating and reporting adverse drug events, injuries and, and hospitalizations and that kind of thing that are reported to the company. And those are actually a completely different type of inspection. Uh, sometimes during manufacturing inspections, we will review adverse events that have been received to get an idea of potential quality problems. But actually evaluating those procedures themselves uh, are a different type of inspection that are done by a different group of people within FDA. Second challenge question, regulatory actions stemming from drug manufacturing inspections may not include A, suspending a firm's drug license, B, seizure of drug products, C, warning letter, or D, withholding approval of applications. And again, I'll give you a little time. Okay, uh, five more seconds. Okay, and the correct answer is suspending a firm's drug license. So only biologics, uh, biological drugs, uh, are subject to licensure um, under, uh, as biologics, the vast majority of drug products are not biologic and there are no licenses that FDA grants to those companies. Uh, that's why in order to stop a company from, from a drug company from violating, we usually do not have the option of pulling licensure. Instead, we have to, uh, generally speaking, we have to take them to court. Okay, and my understanding is questions will be handled a little bit later. Um, but for now, thank you very much for, uh, for listening to my talk, and I look forward to your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Hi, Russ. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was excellent. And actually, we're going to go ahead and take uh, questions now. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our first question. So if a firm gets um, a finding by an FDA investigator on a 482 or 43 and they don't understand the finding, what's the best way for them to go ahead and get a clear understanding of that finding? So the best approach is during the inspection itself. Um, usually, so if you're receiving a 43, it's at the end of the inspection at a closeout meeting. And the, the best approach, if you don't understand, is to ask, ask the investigator or inspection team who's there uh, to explain. And um, that's perfectly okay. If for some reason after the inspection, you have those questions. Uh, you should have investigators' business cards, so you can call or email them, or it can also be part of a um, inspection response as well. But generally speaking, the earlier that you ask, uh, the better off you're going to be. And asking in person is is what I would recommend. Okay, great. Thanks, Russ. The next question is about um, supplier audits. So are the details of internal and supplier audits in scope? Or is it acceptable that only the summary reports be provided? And if you can speak a little bit louder, that would be great for our transcriptionist. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I hope this is better, uh, louder, louder that is. So internal audits and supplier audits are, are pretty different, right? The goal of an internal audit is for a company to take a look inward and challenge itself in order to find problems that it may not be aware of and then to deal with those problems. So uh, FDA generally does not ask for internal audits. Um, supplier audits, on the other hand, are when a company will evaluate suppliers. So whether that's uh, a company that is providing a component or uh, packaging type, for example, 
or it could be um, a contract manufacturer, a company that's actually making product uh, for you. That is definitely within scope of uh, CGMPUs, and the uh, that's considered part of material controls, which is one of the systems that happen during these inspections. Uh, that that's something that should be expected uh, during an inspection. Okay, great. And our next question is, how is COVID currently impacting the scheduling of PAIs? So uh, not just PAIs, but all inspections. Uh, starting in March of this year, uh, FDA announced that they that uh, inspections would be temporarily stopping. And then uh, after a while, a, a, a um, a system was introduced by which FDA will conduct either what are considered mission critical inspections. So the absolute most important inspections that we do that have a direct impact, the most direct impact on public health. Um, there's also a, an attempt using essentially wherever an inspection would occur, making sure that it's safe for that inspection to happen. So this is a state by state, sometimes county by county, uh, activity FDA is doing uh, in order to try to do inspections where possible. In fact, FDA came out with a Q&A guidance just last week that talks about this. Uh, if you Google FDA COVID guidance, there's a list of all the guidances FDA has come out since the pandemic started. And one of them, uh, the most recent one, last I looked, uh, is this Q&A. So I'd recommend anyone who's not sure of what's happening right now to, to look up that guidance. Great, thank you, Russ. All right, another question. Does FDA inspect a drug distribution facility or site? Should a distribution site be included in the 3.2 A1 facilities and equipment? So the, uh, as far as inspecting distribution facilities, it's definitely within FDA's authority to do so. Uh, it's, in the past, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a very common type of inspection for us because in most cases the risks are, are fairly low. Uh, but in the future, I would expect more of those types of inspections. Um, my understanding is that there, so the FDA, the FDNC Act was, uh, uh, was modified by Congress, I think it was 2013, uh, with the idea of, um, uh, having better control over distribution, uh, pharmaceutical distribution within, within the United States. And there's a number of requirements, things like serialization and the like, that um, are still being put in place. Those, those requirements are being phased in over time. And my understanding is that there will be inspections of those activities in the future. But as of right now, it's, it's not a common thing for us to inspect, um, but it, it can happen uh, on occasion, uh, especially if it's uh, a specific reason in a in, you know case by case basis. So, um, but no, that it's certainly not as common as manufacturing and testing. Okay, great. If a, another question, if a site is already inspected for DP chemical testing and a manufacturer wants to use it for DS chemical testing as well, will this trigger a fresh round of inspection? For example, does just to to clarify, does FDA discriminate between API and DP testing site operations? Right. So just to clarify for anyone who maybe didn't catch, uh, DP is a uh, drug product, so finished drug product, things like tablets and uh, pre-filled syringes, for example. Uh, DS is drug substance or API, so the, the chemicals that, that get put into the finished drug products. Uh, you know, in the question, if, say, a finished drug manufacturer um, starts producing APIs, would that trigger a uh, fresh round of inspections by FDA? So, in general, when a manufacturer starts making a new type of product, so not just finished drug product versus API, but it could be, you know, say a tablet manufacturer starts making um, sterile, sterile injectable drugs or inhaled drugs or something like that, something really quite different, then uh, 
there's no set rule on, you know, uh, FDA shall inspect within a certain number of days or months or anything like that. But in general, yes, uh, that I would expect, I would expect interest from the FDA sooner than you normally would. So uh, again, it tends to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, I would expect expanding operations like that to, uh, um, to result in, in, in inspections sooner than, than otherwise would be the case. Okay, great. And I believe you ch touched on this in your presentation, but can you go over the differences between FDA Form 482, 483, and EIR and warning letters? Sure. So at the start of domestic inspections, uh, FDA investigators will issue an FDA 482, which is it's just a document um, of who the investigators are and you know the, the date and time they showed up and the name of the company and it's really it's just letting uh, the company know that and, and keeping and giving a record of the start of an inspection. A FDA 483 uh, is not always issued, but when it is, it's at the end of an inspection, and that is a, it's meant to be a concise list of the most of significant findings from that inspection. So it tends to be, you know, each observation would be, say, uh, either one sentence or one paragraph, maybe a couple of paragraphs, nothing really, really elaborate, but enough to get the point, uh, to get the idea across of what the finding was. In EIR, which stands for Establishment Inspection Report, that's something that the investigator or investigators will write after the inspection is done. So go back to their office and take however long, days or weeks, you know, depending on the nature of the inspection, and they'll write, it's much more detail, not just about the findings, so whatever was on the 483, but also what the company uh, does, right? So a summary of what the company does, details of who they are, so who are the key individuals within the company. Um, another key part of EIRs is the evidence to support findings. So it, we can't just say that, uh, for example, the company didn't clean its equipment well, right? We have to prove it. So that's really the goal of the EIR is to get that in-depth information across as well as the evidence supporting findings. And then the last part was warning letters. So everything I've talked about so far comes from individuals, uh, the FDA investigator or investigators. A warning letter is comes from the FDA as a whole. So that's the FDA saying we have evaluated all, all of the evidence that the investigators collected, and we think that the findings are significant enough that we need to send an official warning to, uh, to this company. All right, great. Thank you, Russ. Um, and we have a question about um, foreign inspections. So what are the expectations when English is not the main language in a foreign inspection? How are the SOPs and GMP documents supposed to be translated? Right, so the expectation is for a foreign inspection where language is, a, is a, the language is not English, of course, is that the company will provide a translator and uh, the, the, the FDA employees who actually contact companies and set up foreign inspections uh, will go through all of this with them. So um, the translator is, uh, should be provided by the, by the company. I, I have done inspections where um, enough of the people at the company speak English that they, they, you know, instead of hiring an official translator, they will try to do it themselves. Sometimes that works well, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, translating is a, a whole skill and prof profession unto itself, so um, it, it's not always, that's not always the best approach. But usually there are, there is an independent translator that's provided. And then as far as translating documents, um, there's no expectation that uh, sort of all documents are translated beforehand or anything like that. Sometimes an investigator will uh, say email ahead of time to say, can you please have these certain key documents translated, maybe procedures or that kind of thing. 
but generally speaking, if, if I'm at an inspection in a foreign country and I have uh, you know, the translator with me, if I want to find out what a given document says, then I'll just ask them to please um, translate certain parts of it. So, you know, I'll ask the company which section deals with X, Y, Z, and I'll say section two, and then I'll turn, turn to the translator and say, okay, could you please start translating um, section two, and we'll kind of go from there. Thank you so much, Russ, for your um, for your presentation. And I think you know we have one more question about PICS. So, as a member of PICS, does the U.S. FDA rec recognize the results of any of the other member states, even if the standard of inspections, you know, are are the U.S. or a different country? Right. So. Pick us, uh, that's actually not the mechanism by which we do that. There's a, there's a program, it's, it's called Mutual Recognition Agreement, and essentially it's a, it's a country by country thing where um, we, it's not so much that we have to abide by their findings, but we can use their findings for, to make our own decisions. So it, it's a, generally it's a two-way street, you know, they can rely on our inspections as well. So uh, if, you know, instead of saying um, this uh, country that we have a uh, mutual recognition with, uh, you know, decided that, that they're going to take away your GMP certificate, for example, um, it's not so much that FDA will just say, okay, we're going to do the same thing. We'll do an independent evaluation of that inspection report and decide for ourselves either are we going to rely on it to take our own action uh, do we think it's compelling enough that we want to conduct our own inspections, uh, or we may decide that we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to follow it for for whatever reason. We may decide to go our own way. Um, again, it's meant to be the kind of thing that each country can use the other's information, but they're not required to. All right, great. Thank you so much, Russ, for all of your insights into the inspection process and domestic and international. And with that, that's going to be um, wrapping up our Q&A section for the day and our drugs track. So I'll pass it over to Brenda, who's going to give our closing remarks.